so Daniel, how could it be that, you know, at least with the churches that I'm familiar with, we're not seeing any manifestation of the power that Jesus promised us. I mean, I started making a list of the verses where Jesus tells us about having faith. And, uh, you know, he's blown away when he finds a man, this, this centurion. He says, Assuredly, I say to you, I've not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And then he's constantly rebuking the disciples. Why are you fearful? You have little faith. Uh, and, and you know, then he says, you know, daughter, um, be of good cheer, daughter. Your your faith has made you well. And then he touched their eyes, some blind men. According to your faith, let it be to you. Oh, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? I mean, and the list goes on of how we need to have faith, and we're we're just not seeing this uh, in our days. So, comment on that. I'd like that. Well, Doug, here's the problem. The Bible says in Proverbs 4.23, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. And the problem is that people don't keep their hearts pure before God. And keeping our hearts pure before God is a little bit more than just keeping sin out of our lives. Anybody can be religious, lock themselves up in a convent, and not look at pornography. But Mm. a heart that's pure and open before God not only pushes out the bad, but pulls in the things of God, the relationship with God. And, and here's mm. where people miss it. They don't have Jesus Christ sitting on the throne of their hearts. That's a very scary place. Because in order to put Jesus on the throne of your heart, you have to come off of it. You have to get outside of yourself. You have to put the flesh under, and you have to die to every goal and agenda that you have. To really put Jesus on the throne of our hearts, we have to say, not my will, but thy will be done. Oh Lord, this is a scary place. But that's where the power is, because that's where Jesus is free to work through us in a full manifestation. And so, you see, people, they don't have their hearts right before God. And this is a subconscious work. We're not talking about mental ascent, Doug. We're talking about mm. a belief system rooted in the knowledge that Jesus has just displaced every idol in our lives. This is not an automatic. Mm. This is a daily decision that is reinforcing mm. a belief system. Okay. Now, yeah. when we get there, well, we begin to walk out into the thoughts of God, into the way that God does things. And then there is power. Then there is that, that, that depth. And, uh, you know, here, here's a really cool picture, okay? Um, because, because people get faith wrong on this point as well. They think that they're going to pray and, and see God do something without having to actually put themselves out there. Like, uh -huh. there's a wall in front of them, and they, so they think, okay, well, this is how it's going to work. I'm going to pray, and God's going to remove the wall, and then I'm going to walk forward. More mm -hmm. often than not, what God says is, walk into the wall, and when you hit the wall, you will watch it dissolve in front of you. When the Israelites entered into the promised land, yep. they had the priests, and they carried the Ark of the Covenant into the river. And God did not part the river until the priests had carried the Ark of the Covenant into the water. They were already in the water. And then God began to move the water out of the way. That, that Ark of the Covenant represents what? Our New Testament, our new covenant in the blood of Jesus. See, that, that covenant, it goes before us. And, and, but we are called to take a step of faith when it doesn't look like God is moving. We have to believe he's moved when the physical world does not agree yet. Yeah, so, this is called so, chutzpah, <laughs> right? <laughs> chutzpah. I mean, when, when Jonathan says to his, his you know, armor bearer, hey, let's go up and see if we can kick some Philistine butt and see if the Lord will be with us. That's called chutzpah, right? That's called audacity. You, you're what? You're testing the Lord, right? And uh, no, it's not testing the Lord. It's believing in what he's already told you to do, right? And and mm -hmm. somehow we, we've we gotten on this, this bandwagon of, well, I don't know. I'm, I'm going to, you know, i got to wait for the word of the Lord on this. 
Whereas I think more often than not, God's like, well, just go for it. I, I, I am with you. I promise to be with you. And that's why I think God is just kind of tickled pink when, you know, little boys like da- like David go up and say, I'm going to take down that giant. God's like, oh, yeah, cool, you know. I'll be with you. You can you can rely upon me. Don't you worry. I'm going to be with you, but I love your audacity, your, your chutzpah. It's really cool. In my house, my wife, she'll get a headache. She'll, she'll get something. What she does is she comes to me. She says, Daniel, I have this issue. Pray for me. <laughs> so I'll lay my hands on her, pray for my wife. Say, in, in the name of Jesus by the stripes of Jesus you're healed and I was like you know well where's your headache where's your this where's your that gone this is casual this is just lifestyle Doug Um, Mm -hmm. see I'm not talking about something that I don't know anything about what I'm talking about is this this is something that God really desires it's called inheritance is what it's called Um, Mm -hmm. there is Real promise. You know, God gives us promises in His Word. You don't promise something you don't intend to fulfill. And God can't lie. Mm-hmm. This is where people get right. promises wrong. They think yeah. God lies yeah. when they don't see the promise fulfilled in their lives. What they don't understand is that the promise is already fulfilled on heaven's side of reality. We need to bring earth into alignment by our faith and obedience. And the Bible says in the book of James that faith without works is dead. In other words, don't think that you can just sit back and believe all day long. Folks, God is going to call you at some point to take a step of faith and to take a step of action. You're going to have to step out and begin praying for people. You're going to have to step out and begin witnessing to people you never thought would accept Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. You're going to have to step out in faith and uh, do things that maybe don't make financial sense in the natural, but God's calling you to do that. Um, I remember, you know, when I published my first book. <laughs> and, and this is going to drive some of your listeners crazy, maybe, because maybe they don't believe in tithing or giving. Um, but I believe strongly in giving, and I give a lot. Well, yeah, that's good. Um, right now, you know, I, I, I'm, right now I'm very financially blessed. But uh, when I went to publish my first book in, in 2010, I <laughs> signed my name on the dotted line, and I owed $10,000. I didn't have $10,000, mm. Doug, but God said, go ahead. Sign it, I'll give it to you. Mm. I wasn't even working at the time. I said, Where you gonna, where's the money going to come from? <laughs> so, but I signed my name, and I was just obedient mm. to God. Well, it turned yeah. out that, you know, by the time I owed the $10,000, I had more than what I needed before I needed it. I had extra, thousands wow. extra. And wow. during that time that I didn't have the $10,000, was I saving every penny? No, I kept giving money away. It's amazing. <laughs> what am I talking nice. about? Well, yeah. I'm talking about living <laughs> according to another realm's rules. Now, this is another part okay. of living according to what's on the other side. See, right. God has provided our every need out of the abundance of his riches and glory by Christ Jesus, Doug. And this is what people that are lacking in finances and other things need to understand. You see, God mm-hmm. has already provided your need. Are you accessing yep. it? And part of the laws of accessing is he who sows abundantly shall also reap abundantly. Yes. (laughs) That's a law of the realm of God. One of the things that we run into... A law. I like that. It's a law. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Laws, promises. You know, we run into all these things in the Word of God. We're talking about getting the way God designed things to work in the Spirit to work in our lives. What is these high, what, what, what rules do these, what, uh, what blessings do these higher dimensions offer us? What, that's what I'm talking about right now. You can pull on resources you don't have that are stored up in a realm that you're not aware of consciously, but it works. Yeah. Well, and, and we're, talking about, we're talking about the warp and the woof of, of the fabric of space itself, fabric of the universe. And 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 these are these are not moral laws, but these are universal laws. Uh, you know, it, it has to do with the infrastructure of the universe. That it's just that's how it is in this you know universe that God has created. And these are laws that He has all throughout Scripture. They're not called this as a law, but you know if it's stated as a truth, then it's true. It's it's a law. And you know what what you're what you're tapping into is saying okay, okay, 
God said it, therefore I'm going to believe it. I'm going to start acting upon that. And just like, you know, if you jump off a tall building, you will fall to the ground. Uh, you know, that's really what we're getting at is that, um, you know, the, these are laws. You know, they're laws just like anything else, and you, you can set your clock by them, right? Uh, that's how we can get people to the moon is because we know the laws of uh, physics and such, and so we can accurately predict when that spaceship is going to get to the moon and they can, you know, measure it within a centimeter of where it's going to land and what it's going to, you know, how it's going to behave. It's predictable. That's really what we're talking about. There's a, pre a predictability in these laws because laws don't change. Is that right? That's, that's right. The people need to understand these things. Because as Christians, if we don't understand these things... You know, we are missing out. We are called to be the sons of God. We are ambassadors mm -hmm. of the kingdom. Second Corinthians five twenty. <laughs> um, see, but, but we're missing out. We're not. We're not as a whole at large. The body of Christ at large is living so far beneath inheritance. Yeah. It exactly. Is Doug, well, and Satan, Satan's strategy is to keep us to keep us distracted, you know, with every vice imaginable, uh, to keep us tuned out with you know lousy TV shows. I mean, that's how I, you know, my most mm -hmm. of my childhood was just, uh, well, not all, you know, not all of it, but uh, a good portion. I was just watching sure. just dumb, mindless stuff on TV, and yeah, I mean, I had no understanding of the spiritual realm. You know, of course, I was a, you know. Whatever, I don't have to talk about me. But, you know, it's to keep us distracted uh, so that we will never really get in touch with that spiritual realm. Now, do you mind if I spend a little bit of time talking about the season that I was going and praying for churches? Go for it, yeah, please. This was one of my greatest learning experiences, Doug, and this is what happened. Uh, I was in prayer one day in my house, and, and God began to speak to me. And as I, you know, made reference to in the last program we did, this is that still small voice. This is a still small voice on the inside of me, the Holy Spirit in my spirit, speaking to me. And over the mm -hmm. years and years of hours of prayer and fasting, I do a lot of fasting, by the way, um, that, that there is a hypersensitivity that develops so that when, when that still small voice is speaking, I, I, I can hear it with pretty good clarity. And it's always hmm. increasing year by year. I mean, the closeness and... Uh, when you, know, when you so fast, is it like a... Is it a complete fast or do you do like a liquid fast or... What kind I of fast do you do? Fasts. If okay. I'm doing like one day... I, I, I'll yeah. often do a total fast, maybe just sip some water. Okay. If I'm doing three right. days, um, I, I've done total fast three days. Yeah. Uh, breaking a total fast after three days can, can mess up your system a little bit. Um, yeah. It, it, it's kind of rough. And I was doing it repeatedly in the season, and I, I kind of started to get sick. Uh, I, okay. I, I, I've done a 30-day fast. This year is how that – I started this year with a 30-day fast, and I, I did juice. So, okay, uh, I've been I've been fasting from coffee. You know, for me that's like, ooh, <laughs> I'm missing and, it. You uh, know? But uh, yeah. But but anyway, so the Lord He spoke to me and He said, Daniel, I, I want you to go and I want you to go and drive to every parking lot and all the churches that are around you, the local churches, and I want you to pray in those parking lots, and I'm going to speak to you. This is what I'm talking about, a step of faith. Now, God is asking me to, to, to do a very real action, you know, kind of like he told Isaiah to walk around, uh, the Bible says naked, I'm thinking he probably had some loin girds on, whatever, but, you know, for two years. This is instruction. He says, actually do this physical action. He told me to go out and, and drive to all these parking lots, park, sit in the parking lots, mm -hmm. and pray. Mm -hmm. Well, I obeyed. And I would, you know, after work, I'd go and I'd park in a parking lot or two and I'd sit there and I'd pray and I'd have my computer with me. Why? Because I was an expectation. I knew God was going to speak to me because he told me he would. 
Hmm. And so, wow. as I was obedient, I would go to these churches, and God would speak to me. Huh, go figure. What he told me opened my eyes to the spirit realm to a whole other level, because what he began to speak to me about was what was occurring in the spirit realm that no one could see hmm. or know if it were not told to them. And uh, I'm not going to share all of the things, because I, I went to a lot of churches, but I have uh, selected a, a few of them that I found to be very um, unique and <laughs> eye-opening that I, I, I do want to share. Um, the one that I, I want to begin with is the only church that God actually had me to go and um, speak with the leadership at the church about the, the prophetic word that he gave me. Mm. There was only one that I actually mm -hmm. spoke to. The rest of them, I just, you know, spoke the prophetic words in my car and drove off. So when I, when I drove into this particular church, instead of praying, God he spoke to me as soon as I got into the parking lot. He said, Daniel, I want you to go inside. So I said, okay. So I went inside. I met the assistant pastor uh, and talked with him. He's a really nice guy. Went back to my car, and the Lord spoke to me. He said, Daniel, this is a, a divine connection. What, what a divine connection is, is a connection in the natural realm that the Lord has authored between mm. two people, two ministries, two groups. Okay? And that's what I call a divine connection. It's, it's a connection that was blueprinted in heaven. Now, the Lord, uh, after I, I, I walked out, began to speak to me. And this is what he told me. Uh, I want you to make a meeting with the head pastor and tell him this. The Lord has sent me to tell you that his eye has been on this church, but the church has been found wanting. Things have been out of place, but now the Lord says that everything is in place. Everything is prepared, and all you are waiting on is the match. Then I saw what looked like a forest fire proceeding forth from the place. Furthermore, I believe the Lord has communicated to me that he has sent me here to help. Um, or, and, and I told him, you know, <laughs> the Lord said, I sent you here to help. That, that, this is basically what I, what I went and told the pastor. Well, well how was that received? You know, you think, <laughs> well, yeah, and that, that's, that's the question. That's the question of the hour. Doug, here's what happened. I sat down and I delivered it one phrase at a time. Now, this guy didn't know me. Right. As a matter of fact, he wasn't even really a, a, a big guy on spiritual gifts. I, right, I, I don't think right. he taught on them at all. But as I gave him the word, phrase by phrase, he confirmed every phrase. And this was the story. Mm. He said, listen, we've had an assistant pastor here, and this was in the news. The, uh, the, the guy, he was a pedophile. And uh, he had wow. slept uh, several times with one of our students. And mm. this has been extremely heartbreaking because we just found out. As wow. a matter of fact, they found out like the day after I went and walked in to talk with the assistant pastor. It was timing like you cannot, you, you can't make this up. And he said, <laughs> this word. When you say things have been out of place, but now the Lord says that everything is in place, you know, we are taking measures to bring correction to everything that's been done. We've reported it to the police. We've done everything in our power, and now we are going to walk through this as righteously as we can be because we had no idea. Wow. But this word is so encouraging. Now, wow. why do I <laughs> say this first? Because what I'm about to tell your audience on the other two will have more validity if they know that, well, the one word that was judged and tested by the pastor himself was true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and this is how I was assigned to help. I actually went there, and I was part of their uh, intercessory prayer team. I, I would go once mm. a week. They weren't my church. But I would pray with them. And I did that for wow. a couple months. Uh, just, just praying with them, praying them through that season of recovering from this terrible catastrophe, you know, when the body is, you know, struggling, like, what, what do we do? How do we understand this? Uh, should we leave? Should we stay? You know, how is our, you know, and I, I'm telling you, God authored the whole thing. He sent me there 
to help them in a time of need, to, to be some extra support in prayer. Mm. And, and to deliver a timely word that, that really encouraged the pastor. He was going through one of the most difficult seasons. He's, I mean, can you imagine? You're the head pastor yeah. of a church that just realized their uh, ex-assistant pastor was a pedophile. I mean, this is not an easy situation. No, no, but yeah, to say the this least. Is how, this is how things happen when you get in touch with the Spirit. This is what it means to be led by the Spirit, folks. I mean, it's mm-hmm. following Jesus, where he tells you to go, you go. What he tells you to say, you say. And he works. Well, there was another church that I went to, and what came to me immediately is, is that this church had no angel. And this is going to sound really strange, and I didn't understand this at first. <laughs> and it was really? like I started to have a vision, and I was like, yeah, there's like no, what, what's going on? As a matter of fact, it was weird. What, what it looked like was like there was like one angel, like far off with like different ribbons coming off of it or something going in different places. This place was one of them, but it didn't have that, that angel or whatever assigned to it. And then God spoke to me about the churches in the book of Revelation. He said, I gave yeah. a word to the angels of each church because each church had one. Mm. This is what happens. When God births a church, when God, but let me repeat that, when God births a church, they are mm-hmm. assigned kingdom provision. They have an angel. Nice. They got you but know, when basically God higher does not, artillery. Yeah. When, when, when God does not birth a church, they do not have kingdom provision. Uh-oh. <laughs> God births every oh, church boy. in the book of Revelation, but God yeah. did not birth that church that I was sitting in their parking lot. Wow. So when you look at church splits, and you watch a church split go five years, seven years, then split again, five years, seven years, then split again, what you're looking at is something that is not birthed by God with no kingdom protection. This is something, you can only understand this when a revelation Ooh. comes from the Spirit. Yeah. I, oh I, my goodness. I was that is scary. And God, he even gave me the timeline. He said, a certain number of years and this church is going to, you know, basically descend into some, some, some trouble. And I was like, wow. There was another church I went to and this one was really heartbreaking. It was one of the larger churches. As I began to pray, what I began to perceive was like a very large reptilian type spirit standing outside of the church probably I'd say about it, it, I perceived it as about 30 stories tall well uh, 30 feet very big okay. and about the size of a Nephilim it, it multiple <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah it was um, it was a reptilian spirit and, and it was see we think that a church building is ruled by the spirit of God what God opened my eyes to that day was that no this church building has another ruling spirit and it is not the spirit of God it's this guy and all those people that go to that church what happens is they sit in an environment that has been tainted by another spirit they are not getting the impartation of Jesus Christ the way Jesus intends them because what this this is why we need spiritual warfare when things like this happen things are out of alignment God needs to come in and bring correction, cleanse the body, cleanse the church. Mm. Someone invited the Spirit in. There was a reason why it had authority to oh. be there. And I saw it. God opened my eyes to it. And I said, wow. Wow. Mm. And, um, you know, what, one of the things... That is, that's that heavy duty, man. Call. That is... When I was in my car, one of the things the Lord had me do was to speak. I I spoke to the Spirit from my car, and I said, your days are numbered. And uh, there were certain things that went along with that. I I don't need to say them on the air, but these are some of the things people, Christians, need to be aware of. You see, we have no idea what's going on. We wonder, you know, why we go to church and we leave feeling empty. There's a reason Hmm. why that happens. And it has to do with this realm beyond That's what we're talking about yeah there was one other church yeah. I went to and I just want to throw this one out there real quick I pulled into the parking lot and this was no church at all it says church 
It said church on the sign. When I pulled in there, this, God spoke to He said this word, Daniel, this is not my church, nor has it ever been. Move on. Just like that. <laughs> I, I, wow. I, I, I literally just pulled in, parked, backed up, and drove off. Wow. <sighs> wow. This is this is really heavy stuff, you know, and I think, um, you know, we've been talking about the spiritual realm. We're talking about just what is just beyond the veil. See, people have to understand, and this was, you know, a revelation for me of how heaven or the the the, the spiritual realm is not far away. It, it's like um, air and water are separated by glass. You know, it's it's like a membrane that's just going between, uh, you know, this this really small membrane, or like a force field between the USS Enterprise and you know those harmful lasers that are trying to destroy it. I mean, it, it's nothing but a uh, some kind of an energy shield that is keeping that domain from this domain. And on on occasion, the prophets and others have been able to see through it. Stephen, when he was being martyred, he could see through the veil. He said he saw the heavens open. Ezekiel saw the heavens open. Jesus at his baptism, the heavens were opened. These are the times when that just a small crack in the veil is opened and people can see through it. Now, Daniel, you've been able to to have some glimpses as well, and I think that's awesome. I'm a little bit jealous because I want to I want to have that same experience. But here's the cool thing: is it is available. It's available, but it takes time of getting to know the Father, spending time in His Word, and not just reading it. See, my trouble is I start reading it, I'm like, oh, that's interesting, or I start looking at the the language, you know, and I start getting onto these academic pursuits again. And um, you know that those have their place, but but not if you really want to, you know, not if you really want to, just you know, you want to know the Lord, and and that's that's truly my goal. I want to know the Lord, and so um, you know, I I want what you're doing. I I want this, you know, big time, and so. Um, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna pray harder. I'm gonna pray more. I'm gonna I'm gonna pray. <laughs> Because, uh, you know, I, I seriously don't want an academic faith anymore. I don't want an academic faith. I want to have a real living faith, a, a powerful, you know, I, I think that the, the, the miracles that Jesus was talking about are still alive. The trouble, as we've kind of been talking about, is that, uh, you know, so many of our theologians have told us that that doesn't happen anymore. That stuff is over. That's the sensationist uh, teaching, and I think much of the church is into that. And once they've they've bought into that theology, then there's zero expectation of the Lord to actually do something. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it, it's really sad to me. And um, you know, I, I I remember when I was in college. You know, I, I was at the very beginning of my journey. I mean. Here I was, I was having visions. I wasn't operating on the level that I, I do today, but I was having visions and, and God was, you know, leading me gently towards deeper things. And I was, I, I went to my leaders and I said, hey, listen, I, I think the gifts of God are for today. I and mean, frankly, I'm having visions. So how, how do you explain cessation when I have this experience? I'm praying in tongues. I am praying in tongues. You're telling me that tongues is not for today, but I am praying in tongues. <laughs> it doesn't make yeah. any sense to me. I mean, right. you know, and I, and I explain it like this. You can take a pie, okay? You can take a pie, and you can say, listen, um, when I let go of this pie, it's going to hit the ceiling. You can draw a diagram. You can make a chart. You can write a book about how the pie will leave your hand and hit the ceiling. But when you remove your hand from the pie and it falls on the floor, there's a problem. You have to address what's actually happening. You can't just make stuff up and choose to go with that because you would rather believe it that way. And that's what people do with cessationism. There's plenty mm. of people speaking in tongues. God's working miracles. He's healing the sick. He's doing that right now. You know, people do prophesy. 
But mm-hmm. they try to argue and say it's all of the devil. Excuse me. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, this is the pie. the pie is not hitting the ceiling. Come on, it's it's going on the floor. That's where the, there was a it, there is a law called gravity, and it's going to put that pie on the floor. I don't care what you say. That pie is not going on the ceiling. And mm-hmm. um, you know it, it's a big problem because here's what people do, Doug. They train themselves out of their inheritance. They actually teach themselves right out of the will of God for their lives and indoctrinate mm. themselves in this nonsense. And it's yes. sad. Yeah. It's sad. It well, that's, again, heart. as a man thinks, you know, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. That, you know, again, and this is where I think Satan has been throwing, um, you know, he's been throwing water in the gas tank of theology for a long time so that, you know, w- you know, yeah, the engine's running, but it's sputtering. And, you know, there, there's so much, just, you know, kind of your average, kind of, you know, your average dude, he he gets a theological training, whether it's from a pastor in church or a professor at the seminary, and then and you hear, nope, sorry, the gifts are done. You know, those are for back then to authenticate the message of the disciples. And then when we come to those verses in Scripture, and we say, well, those aren't for today because my professors told me, and so again, we're not. Ex- we have no expectation. Within, with that, therefore, we have no power, really. Uh, yeah, okay. Satan has lost us to you know, to to go be with the Lord Jesus, you know, in the hereafter. But right now, he's not worried about us at all because we're so weak. You know, we're not a threat to him. He's like, you guys aren't doing anything. Uh, or we start thinking that we have to, we have to, you know, go get pickets and and uh, picket signs and and start picketing, you know, this or that, certain causes, and you know, there's a place for that. But but you know, really, we need to be involved in this this spiritual dimension, and we have to start believing that the promises that God gave, that Jesus spoke to the disciples, if anyone believes in me. The works that I have done, he also will do, and greater than these. Right? John 14. These are the promises that we have to start taking literally and latching on to and say, I don't quite get it. You know, and this is, I've been trying to work this out theologically, but, um, you know, I, I mean, here's something just to think about. This is kind of a curveball, okay? But uh, I, heard it, I heard it from a, a very good source that there are some New Agers, okay, they don't believe in Jesus, they're into the New Age, they're looking for spiritual things. But, you know, they can see an aura around a person. Mm -hmm. And, in fact, it was reported to me that one time a New Ager was at a a Christian healing uh, service, I think in India or some country. And... um, you know, he, he went up to this pastor later, and they just kind of struck up a conversation. He says, oh, I know how he does that. He's like, well, how? The pastor says, how does he do it? He says, oh, it's, no, it's, it's easy. He says, he says well, it, he, he can just see the angel going and touching people and making them well. And, uh, and the pastor's like, uh, really? And the, the New Ager guy is like, what? You, <laughs> oh, are you one of those people that can't see? <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. And... Uh, you know, this story, it kind of shakes me because I'm like, really? Uh, how can it be that a New Ager who doesn't know the King of Kings, right, but is able to have a have a, a window into that realm? Now, you could just say, well, that's just a bunch of nonsense. But, you know, my, my friend that told me uh, knows this on, on good, uh, you know, on, on good testimony. So I tend to believe it. I don't think it's a fake story. But, you know, there's something yeah. about that that we have, we've just kind of thrown the whole thing out. Well, and, and this, is, this is what the enemy does. He, he tries to take the children's bread. You know, and he, the, here's the truth. The truth are, is that spiritual eyes are spiritualized. You know, every sense, sensory, that we have in our physical body is mirrored in our spirit man. Our mm-hmm. physical body has eyes. Our spiritual body has eyes. Our physical body has ears. Our spiritual body has ears. That's why mm-hmm. Jesus, after having thousands of people hear and see what he just said, say they cannot see or hear. 
Yeah. They, they didn't spiritually see or hear. But those are spiritual senses that Jesus acknowledged himself. He said these, mm. <laughs> there's, a, there's spiritual sight and spiritual hearing. Mm-hmm. And if you peruse the scriptures, and you, know, you, you find that there's also a spiritual sense of smell. There's a spiritual sense of, of taste, taste and see that the Lord is good. Um, there's a spiritual sense of touch. And, and um, mm. the, the devil, mm. demons, can open up a person's spirit such that they become aware of their spiritual senses, just like the Holy Spirit can. Mm. And, um, and, and, well, they do. And, and there are people like that that can see into the spirit realm in that way. Uh, you know, the problem is often times there's torment associated with that. I, I was born with my spiritual eyes wide open, mm. frankly, and I think that mm. had to do with, you know, the fact that there was voodoo on my dad's side and Billy Dima on my mom's side. I mean, you know, Interesting. I was seeing okay. twins when I was like two years old. I, <laughs> I remember walking really? around the, wow. the room and my parents. I was just following around a spirit saying, what's that? What's that? You know, I uh-huh. I, I, I saw a different kinds of spirit. One of them that appeared to me looked like a, a picture story of Noah. <laughs> Noah showed up in my bedroom, and it was not Noah. Wow. <laughs> it was yeah. Extremely terrible. Um, you know, I, I remember one time I, this was in college, I, I had a, you know, I, my, my spiritual eyes had, had closed quite a bit by that time, but, you know, uh, they, they would open just enough for me to get tormented sometimes. And then the first time I got wasted in college, I mean, totally drunk, you know, I wasn't following Jesus. Well, I, I fell into like a trance sleep, and I, basically the spirit crawled out of my... I mean, this is going to sound funny, but this is how I perceived it. It came out of my TV. It was like a white noise static came in my TV. This thing crawled out. It like flashed around the room a few times and it jumped on me. And I was like literally spiritually oh. wrestling with this thing, getting my butt whooped. Finally, I managed to murmur the name Jesus and it laughed. And it was really mm-hmm. terrible. I mean, it wore me out for days. I was just wow. totally spiritually beat up. And, you know, um, but, you know, I saw these things. I also, I, I mean, I did uh, see an angel when I was about five or six. Uh, in a church. I, I, I saw that it was standing there. It had the white gown. It didn't have wings. And you know, I saw it. My physical eyes were open, but my spiritual eyes perceived it through my, my physical eyes. I mean, and, and I saw it. Now, most of my discerning of the spirit realm actually occurs inside. And uh, this is a little bit more difficult to explain, but it's, it's, um, it's coming through basically the filter of the Holy Spirit. So there's no torment associated when I identify a demonic spirit or when the Mm. angelic is going on. I'll know that angels are there. I remember, you know, one time I was praying in a lady's house and and the God opened a little boy's eyes and the little boy was saying, wow, look at all the angels. Well, I didn't see the Mm. angels, but I knew they were there. I could have told them. (laughs) Yeah, there's a lot of angels here right now. You know, but it's, um, this is interaction with the spirit realm and, and our senses, we have these spiritual senses. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, we're 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 running out of time again quickly here. Um, <laughs> can, can, you know, kind of take. I mean, obviously we've been talking about this, but I just want to shift gears just a little bit of, um, the, you know, this the, the the world beyond the veil. All right. I mean. Obviously, we've been talking about what that means here and now, which is totally exciting, and I think it's so important, uh, and I crave it. But you know, what about um, you know, what about this this world beyond the veil? What is it like? Uh, in, you know, just kind of maybe bring that together for us again. You know, we, we've talked a little bit here and there, but I, you well, know, just I, what is I, that world like? But you should be asking you that question since you just released your your book, Millennium Chronicles. <laughs> um, well, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, we, we we do see in Scripture, and and you know, we were talking about this before the program. I mean, people do have a false concept of heaven in that they think yeah. that heaven is the eternal state after we die, where it is. But really, God is bringing it into the new heavens and the new earth. He's, it's going to encompass the earth. And um, we're going to have jobs and assignments in eternity that uh, come after this life as, as part of that, uh, that, that God is bringing in and so forth. And, um, you know, I, I was, uh, <laughs> when I first read your book, Doug, you know, Millennium Chronicles, I, I, I really, um, <laughs> I thought your view was interesting. 
but I didn't buy it at first. And um, mm-hmm. you know, I, I told you on, on the phone, you know, earlier today, that the, the more I thought about it, really, the more it seems to be um, making sense that there will be a new heaven and new earth as part of the return of Jesus. On the other side of that, there is this mm. new heaven, new earth taking place, and then, um, you know, a thousand years taking place in that time frame. I mean, I, there's a lot of there's a lot of validity to that to your view, and um, one of the really interesting things that I have found respected to that, it, it comes in Ezekiel chapter 48, which which I haven't mm. really um, you know spent too much time exploring. Ezekiel 40 through 48, simply because it, it's kind of confounding. You know, you read it and you see this description of a temple that has never been built, and mm-hmm. it's so specific, the dimensions are so exact and everything. But, you know, as you, as, as you get through it, you, you find some interesting things. One, you see this river of living water coming out of the throne in the temple. And right. it's like, well, there's a river of living water in the end of the book of Revelation coming out of the, the throne. But this is yeah. happening... After Ezekiel 38, 39 war and some of these things take place, it's like that. It's after that time frame you see Ezekiel being presented with this revelation. Yeah. And here's the yeah. other thing that's really interesting, and I, I, I'll turn it back over to you because, you know, I, I'd like to hear your <laughs> thoughts on this briefly. When you get to sure. chapter 48 of, of Ezekiel and you're looking at, uh, you know, the division of the land and what's going on there. There, there's two things referenced. You see the temple, and you see a city. And in Ezekiel 48, I've always wondered, I said, what is the city? <laughs> I don't know. Mm, um, yeah. What you brought to the table, so to speak, which is, I think this is so much fun because... Um, <laughs> You know, uh, maybe one day you'll join me in the post-trip camp, but uh, <laughs> it, it really goes curveball for some of these uh, dispensationalist pre-trippers that, that are really hardcore on the, the way it works. Um, but, you know, you see this city, and you see this, this, this temple here, and I'm wondering, could it be that the New Jerusalem is the city referenced in Ezekiel 48? I mean, what are your thoughts? Yeah, well, you know, it's interesting, because it, it talks about a, a holy district, uh, now, holy district, uh, in Revelation 20, it says that Satan will go and gather the nations from the four corners of the earth and gather them, uh, and they will come over the broad plain of the earth, surround the camp of the saints. Okay? So, holy and saint is the same exact word, right? One is English, one is Latin. Yeah. All right? So, holy and saint are exactly the same word. So, you've got the whole holy district that's the that's the camp of the saints and then the property of the city well that's the beloved city you know so that's uh that's really the solution is that <clears throat> that these are both in the same general vicinity uh and and you know and part of the, part of the trouble is that people have the dimensions of the new jerusalem uh just a bit too big you know um and I don't want to digress too much, but if you look in Revelation, or excuse me, Ezekiel 48, it says these are the exits of the city. The exits of the city, and notice that the gates of the city are the same names of the, you know, the the the, the tribes, just like you have in Revelation 21, right? And uh, but it says these are the gates of the city, measuring 4,500 measures. A measure is not a cubit; it's it's a, it's a different. It's uh, actually 10.4 feet. So, and what's so fascinating about that is in Revelation 21, he says, he says, uh, and he went out to measure the the city, the gates, and its walls. He measured the city, the its gates, and its wall. Well, we in Revelation 21 we get the measure of the city, we get the measure of the of the wall, but we don't get the measure of the gates. The measure of the gates is given to us in Ezekiel 48. And so when it says that it's 18,000 uh, uh, measures all around, it's not talking about the total circumference of the city. It's talking about the the sum total of the gates of the city. 
So each one of those gates is about three miles across. These are big, 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 massive gates. But you know, they're they're never closed, so you don't need to put doors on these things. They're just they're they're portals, they're entryways. And um you know, so there really is no conflict here. They they fit perfectly well. So but you know, I didn't want to talk about that. I wanted to keep picking your brain. <laughs> so I got you on the show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, but this is you know this, this is a this is a very relevant part of the discussion is you know there is um, there is our interaction with heaven on this side of the return of Jesus Christ, and then there is our interaction with heaven on the other side of the return of Jesus Christ, and you know on this side uh, there there is a veil. Mm-hmm. There's a veil between us and what I call the second heaven. That's where like the battles take place that we see in Daniel chapter ten between the angel and the prince of Persia. And you know, um, then then I you know say there's also a veil between us and the third heaven, where God is and I'm sitting on His throne in paradise. Second um, mm-hmm. Corinthians chapter twelve and and uh, mm-hmm. but here's what I see. Okay, and I, I've actually made a post on my Facebook wall recently. And a lot of people <laughs> like this thought. You know, as we move into the last days, what I believe we are going to see is a great increase in the number of people from both dark and light, from the kingdoms of both the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light, begin to walk seemingly between worlds. In other words, Mm. there is a great degree of interaction that is beginning to take place. And it's Mm. not just the enemy that is tapping into these other dimensions and realms to do his dirty work. God, I believe, is raising up a people in response that is going to begin to tap into and interact with his realm. The genuine verse, the counterfeit, that there are people that are trying to pull in realities, that are trying to pull in resources from literally the realms controlled by the devil. But God is trying to give his people a revelation that, you know what, what I have for you is much greater, it's much more powerful, and it is necessary in order for my will to be executed in the last days. I believe that God is is really working in a number of people now to give them a revelation. And see, I call it the kingdom of God. I just call it the kingdom. So the, the whole revelation of the kingdom, I believe, hinges on an understanding that we are interacting with another realm. So when we talk about kingdom, I say the kingdom is the realm in which God is king. It's, it's another mm-hmm. realm that's been overlapped yep. upon the believers in this earth. This is God. That's why God said, I put it on the inside of you. And, mm-hmm. you know, Christians, we need to understand several things about interacting with this realm. One, we need to understand what we're interacting with. We're yeah. interacting with the government. I, 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 okay. I, I'm so amazed that so many Christians look at the kingdom of God as a social club. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, yeah. We just can make up whatever we want. If we want to believe this, we believe it. If we want to do this, we do that. You know, uh, we don't need to follow the rules that say celibacy before marriage. Or, you know, don't even worry about homosexuality. That's okay. You know, well, we don't like this one. And, and, you know, clearly we see what Paul writes. These things do not inherit the kingdom. (laughs) Galatians Mm. chapter 5. There's a list. I mean, that's not even Old Testament. That's New Testament. There's a list. Yeah. Fornications, adulteries, murders, thievery. I mean, but, but we think, well, we just make up whatever we want. But we are a part of a kingdom. There, there is mm. an order, a structure. There is a way of doing things. God's the king. We're not. <laughs> well, <laughs> let's, 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 let's kind of camp out on that idea for a second. Uh, what did you say? Galatians what? Five? Je- yes. Okay, so... Uh, you know, these things will not inherit. Uh, if you do these, um, <clears throat> you will not. All right, okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, 519. The works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, and cleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in the time past that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. 
all right, well, this is kind of a scary thing. But, you know, but I went forward and I said the sinner's prayer. <laughs> so now what? You know, uh, you're, you're telling me that if I do these things, if these are the things that I practice, not, you know, not tripping over them, but these are the things that I'm practicing. Uh, you know, and practicing means like you practice the piano every day, or at least you're supposed to. Um, <clears throat> you know, you do these on a continual basis that the kingdom of heaven is not for me. So maybe I was saved, but now I'm not saved? Or what, what are you saying about this? Okay. Well, you're asking me my honest, uh, my honest interpretation of this text. This is what I believe it means. I believe that our salvation is secure. In other words, okay. um, I believe that inheriting the kingdom mm -hmm. is, is equivalent to access. In, in other words, you know, um, I, I can, you know, let's say someone dies, right? And they give us a, an inheritance. And they say, hey, you know, we, we want to leave this, this mansion to you. But, well, we refuse to take the phone call. Mm. It doesn't mean that, you know, they, they didn't leave it to us or whatever. It, it, it means that we haven't apprehended it. What I have found, Doug, is that okay. sin, yeah. sin, and this is in practice, Sin blocks off the kingdom and all of its okay. blessings yes. from people. Here's what I have yes. found. When someone is in unforgiveness, yeah. let's say I pray for their healing. They won't get healed. And when okay. they forgive, suddenly yeah. there's a lifting. And then when I pray yeah. for them to be healed, they are healed. It's uh -huh. a block on the inheritance that they have in the kingdom. But this is not touching salvation in my perspective because salvation okay. is a work that Jesus does all by himself. Okay. All right. This is fair how enough. I, uh, no, I understand it. Fair. Well, it could even be that, you know, if, uh, well, we don't have to go down that path anymore. <laughs> That's, that could always be a tricky path. Um, but, um, yeah, we're almost out of time. My goodness. You know, you're so right. If, you know, if we're practicing these kinds of things, again, Galatians 5, 19 through 21, adultery, fornication, and cleanness, lewdness, etc. Um, you know, these are the things that we're practicing, that we're habitually doing. These are the habits. This is the programming that's in our subconscious, called it our heart. Then the power of the kingdom is not available. It's not available. Um, and so we have to put away those things. Once we put away those things, then the power and manifestation of the kingdom becomes available. And, you know, this has some pretty big implications because, and you know, even modern science is, is catching up with the Bible when it discovers that um, when the, the, that so many illnesses are actually related to uh, issues of the heart, issues of, you know, how, yeah. you're, how you're thinking, right? I mean, obviously, mental illnesses are that way many times, probably more times than not. But then you also have physical conditions. I mean, it says that uh, a joyful heart is good medicine, but a, a, uh, but a broken spirit dries up the bones. This is, this is true. It's not just some cute little proverb. It, it, this is true. It's a law. And, you know, modern science is discovering this as well. They're finally figuring this out. So if we are practicing these wicked kind of things, whatever they may be of this list, then we're not, not going to enjoy the blessing. We're not going to enjoy the power, the peace, the prosperity, the goodness of God that is available not just for us in the hereafter, but actually in the here and now. And, and you know, who doesn't want that? I mean, you know, I'm looking forward to mm -hmm. to uh, being with with Jesus forever. But you know, I'd like to kind of get things a little started a little bit sooner than that too. So, you know, this is how we can tap into that. Mm. Yeah, I would love to well, add this is, some more. To it, but I think we're out of time. Please. Well, we got about four minutes, so go for it. I'll stop you. <laughs> okay. You know, I mean, and, and you're hitting it on the head here. It, it, the, the, you're hitting the nail on the head. See, Christians have a problem. It's called sin. Even after we come to Jesus Christ, if we continue to sin, we have a big problem. We are living mm -hmm. after the old nature, and we are opening ourselves up to laws that allow the devil to steal from us. 
You see, well said. Uh, the yeah. Bible says that yeah. the devil comes not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Yes. Now, sin breaks down the hedge that God desires to keep around our lives. Right. It's like a person who has a fortress and goes outside and plants dynamite and blows it up themselves. Well, it's like and Job, right? You know, Jesus, Satan says to, to God, I can't get to Job. You put a hedge around him, right? I mean, you know, that's yeah. what we're talking about, right? Because he was a righteous man. It wasn't just some force field God randomly put up, but, but Job was doing his part, and so God was doing his part. And Satan's like, I can't get to the guy. It's yeah. amazing. And, um, you know, sin, sin's a big problem. This is why Christians, we need to repent. 1 John 1, 9. If any man has any sin, let him repent, and God is faithful and just to forgive him of all mm -hmm. his sin and cleanse him from all unrighteousness. You know, mm -hmm. we need that. We need that daily. Yeah. We need that all the time to, to maintain the kind of relationship that, like, I have with Jesus, you know, yeah. where I'm, I'm speaking to him daily. And are, are you kidding? If I was out there doing all kinds of nonsense, I mean, I don't know how that relationship could be maintained. I, 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 you know, some people, they feel very distant from God. But when they repent, suddenly God feels so close to them. This is what I'm talking mm. about. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, yeah, and and we've got to be so careful because then the Satan, the the devil comes back and kind of gets us back into our old lifestyle. Yeah, but you like this thing so much, you don't want to give that up, you know. But you, that's your favorite show, that's your favorite movie, that's your favorite website, right? You know, or, or whatever you, whatever it may be. I mean, you know. So, <laughs> yeah, well said. I mean, we we've got to just be so careful. To stay away from that stuff because it, it's just like it, it's like it's like poison that he's continuing to give us. Here, have a little bit more poison, isn't it nice? Oh, I love this poison, yeah. and we wonder why we have no strength. We wonder why we have no power. It's because as we're drinking poison all the time, and God's like, "Stop drinking that poison! I want to give you guys power." And um, you know, I, I I just you know, I again, I think our theology is leading the way. Our theology of saying that most of these things are have, have ceased, there really is nothing there, and so you know, 99% of us are not going and looking for it because we don't think it's even there. Theologically, we've already are, have convinced ourselves that there's nothing to look for. So you know, when people like you come along, we start saying, "Well, that guy's kind of weird. He must be sniffing glue or something," you know. And yet, the <laughs> reality is that you're the guy that's actually in tune with the Lord. And what what the Lord's doing, and you know the rest of us are just missing out on it. So, uh, you know, more power to you, man. Keep it up. Uh, thank you for coming back and schooling us on how to be in touch with the spiritual realm. I mean, it's something that I want. Again, uh, my days of, of of purely intellectual Christianity are over. Uh, I want mm. uh, I want to go to the next level, you know, and I'm desperate <laughs> to get there. So. Uh, you know, you have uh, instructed me. I, I appreciate it. You're a young man, but you have uh, wisdom beyond your years. And so, everyone, I just want to encourage you to go to BrideMovement.com. Uh, Daniel's the real deal. He's done some great stuff. We're blessed to have you on, Daniel. Keep up the good work. Keep praying, and um, it's going to be exciting what the Lord is going to do in these last days. And you know, everyone, the days are short. It's time that we get serious with the Lord right now, right? Life goes really fast. Uh, our, our, all of our material things are going to are going to pass away one day. So we've got to be you know, focused on what what the Lord would have us do in these last days, and we want to be powerful. I mean, regardless of what you think about the rapture and all that stuff, who cares? It's we need to get in the game and be used by the Lord in these days because time is truly short well again thank you until next week everyone stay in the word seek the Lord with all your heart you've been listening to according to the scriptures I'm your host Douglas Hamp thank you uh, Daniel for being with us until next week God bless <laughs>